Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. My name is uh, Stacy Penna, and I'll be um, uh, just monitoring this and introducing our speaker in two seconds. Uh, I just wanted to go over uh, some of the go to webinar menu items for you. So in the top right hand corner of your screen, there's a white arrow with an orange box. If you click on the arrow, it opens up the menu and you'll see that you can um, uh, ask questions at any time or we'll take questions at the end, but feel free to type them in as you think of them. Uh, there's also the handout so you can um, download the handout. It's just of the slides today. And everyone is on mute uh, for now, just to help with a uh, control of, of noise background. Uh, and we are recording this. So you get a recording a few days after the webinar. So with that, um, I'll get started. Uh, so today's session is on lessons in managing and supporting a team of qualitative researchers with uh, Lindsay um, uh, Giesen, who I'll introduce in a second from Westat. And it's um, and here we have uh, your host today. So myself, uh, Stacy Penna. I'm the in vivo community director here at QSR, and um, my co-host from Sage Publications, um, Ali. She wasn't able to make it to the webinar today. She's actually in uh, London, uh, but I just wanted to say that it's been great working with her, and it's been great collaboration with Sage Publication on these webinar series we've been doing. Um, and so for our presenter today, um, uh, Lindsay Giesen, who is a senior study director at Westat with more than 12 years of experience in program evaluation and policy research. Uh, she's managed and or participated in program evaluations and research studies at the state and national levels on topics such as child nutrition, workforce development, child welfare, food security, child care, and federal health programs. Um, and Lindsay will be talking to us how, with one of the studies she worked on at Westat um, on how to manage um, a team of, of coders. So with that, I'd like to welcome uh, Lindsay. Hi, thank you. And I'm going to make Lindsay the uh, presenter, so just give me a second and then you'll see her screen. Okay. Great, perfect, we can see it, Lindsay. All right. Uh, well, thank you everyone for coming. Um, I, I'm really excited to be talking with you today. Uh, and it, so before I start, actually, we're going to do a quick poll um, just to give me a little background on who's in the audience and um, the poll is just going to ask what everyone is accustomed to in your own qualitative work. Um, so you should see a little poll open um, pop up on the side. Yep, so I have um, it open it and it's asking um, encoding qualitative data, do you tend to work alone or with others? And if you can pick one of the three choices, that'd be great. So I'll just give people some time and then I'll show the results. All right, I'm going to close the poll and then I'll share it. So it looks like we have 41% of people um, that are uh, working alone, 35% uh, with one other person and 24% as part of a group. Okay, interesting. Um, well, there's a good mix of people, obviously. Um, and so what uh, I'll talk about today will hopefully give those of you who work alone or with only one other people sort of a crash course in how you might work with um, a larger group. And those of you who work in a group, you know, just some ideas to help you manage that process. All right, so today's goals are really just to prepare you for leading a team in in uh, qualitative coding and just you know talk with you about what training and resources you might need um, the quality control measures you can put in place uh, and talking about just how to stagger the coding um, to help you manage the process when you've got you know a, a large number of source documents you've got to go through um, in a short timeline, and uh, also just a little bit about how to accommodate team members who might move at different paces and have different skills. Um, 
And I also just want to be clear that what I'll describe are strategies that have served me well on my studies. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of different ways to do things. So, you know, take what could work for you, but talk with uh, others that are leading projects about their processes as well so that you can find something that fits for your work. So most of what I'll talk about is based in work that I did for the Food Nutrition Service or FNS. Uh, and FNS oversees the school breakfast program and the national school lunch program, um, among a lot of other things. But we had a study that the whole purpose was to talk with states and school districts and schools about how they collect and report data on the school meal programs and identify where errors might be introduced um, in the data. And then finally provide recommendations to um, improve the accuracy of the data that's collected on the meal program. So that's sort of the background to where all this originated. Um, and we, as I'll talk about later in the program, we um, had three different levels of respondents, uh, but four different respondent types. So, you know, starting um, at the top, we had four states and it really um, ended up being sort of case studies. And we had Alabama, New York, Oklahoma, and Wyoming. Those were our four states. And within the states, we talked to two different types of state level respondents. Um, and then within each state, we selected 10 school districts. And within each school district, we talked with three different schools. So those were sort of our um, the levels that I'll be talking about a little bit later, but I just wanted to give you that context. Uh, so, you know, all of us have encountered at least one of these challenges at some point. Um, and with the study I just mentioned, we encountered all four of them. Um, we had a pretty compressed data collection period of February through May. Um, and once that ended, we had about six weeks to train our team and it, have them code what ended up being about 150 interview transcripts. Um, and each of those transcripts, some were shorter, you know, only around uh, a 30 minute interview, but others were up to an hour and a half. So it, it was quite a lot of data. Um, and we developed a two tiered coding scheme and uh, one was more general. I call, we called it the structural coding scheme. Um, and that really mapped onto the um, the higher level topics that we covered in the interviews. And it, then we had a more detailed analytic coding scheme that we used to dive into the details of um, each topic that we wanted to explore. Uh, so it was just, you know, we ended up having about 120 codes that we applied to the different kinds of transcripts. So it was, it's a lot to keep in your head at once. Um, and lastly, we had uh, a team of um, coders and senior reviewers, but, you know, the coders, uh, they were more junior staff and only one had done any coding of qualitative data before. Um, so it really did, in the end, give us a sense of, you know, how do you really prepare your team and train your team um, to produce quality work if they've never done this before? All right, so when we uh, finished the study and we're sort of reflecting back, um, we realized that there were several um, key lessons learned for us, and I'll sort of go through them one by one. The first is that uh, it's, it doesn't help to try to teach your team everything that they need to know at once. You know, you, you've got to create sort of a foundation of skills and knowledge and uh, try to build on that over time. Um, and, it, you know, coders, especially those who have never coded before, there's only so much they can absorb. So, um, you know, we broke our training and our coding into, um, into pieces by training them on one type of transcript at a time. Uh, and then once that was done, we would move on to the next. And it was just sort of a cycle that we created that we found worked really well. So what we started with was a one day in-person training just to go over the basics. Um, so 
I also want to mention that the agenda for this one day training um, is in the journal article that this presentation is based off of. Um, so you can, if you want to look at the different topics we covered and the amount of time we allotted and what the value was of each session, you can see that um, as one of the figures in the journal article. Okay, so uh, the training really began with covering the study objectives and the research questions. And, it, you know, this is an obvious place to start your day, but what we really wanted to communicate to our team here is what the end product is that you're hoping to produce and what the questions are that you're trying to answer. Because, you know, those of us who work regularly with qualitative data, there's so much noise in that data. And, you know, you've we talked about the study objectives and research questions in, um, in the context of how do you pick out what is important to code and what do you disregard as just noise? So, you know, it really gave them a sense of, um, of how to be discerning. And it, so, as I just mentioned, the we went over the coding scheme then for one respondent type. And we started with the schools because that was the shortest interview. And so they were the shortest transcripts and they were also the least complicated. Um, we were covering a fairly uh, discrete set of topics. And it, so we just felt like this would be a good place to start our team off. Um, so first we looked at the coding scheme. And by coding scheme, I just mean the list of codes that you're going to apply. Um, to each transcript. So we looked at the coding scheme for the school transcript and it, we handed out uh, a paper copy of one of the school transcripts from one of the interviews that we did. And we had them uh, write on the paper copies which codes they thought best applied to each piece of text. Um, and so we, it was very intentional to teach them on paper first because we wanted to first acclimate the coders who, as I said, were more junior and only one of them had ever done any coding. So we wanted to first acclimate them to just the process of coding in general. Um, so we had them do it by hand. And then later that afternoon was when we walked them through and Vivo and it sort of, you know, helps them figure out how to navigate the database. Um, but we had them code that same transcript in in vivo so that they got practice within the software as well. Um, and so after both of those practice coding rounds, the one on paper and in in vivo, we talked as a group and it, it just, you know, we talked through any points where people were confused or they were uncertain about which codes to apply. Um, it also, it, it, it was really helpful because, you know, I built the coding scheme the way that it would work in my head. And so having people actually apply it to real data and seeing how, how other people interpreted the codes I had written, it really highlighted where um, the code book that I made wasn't clear enough or places where the coding scheme could be improved. Um, and so it, it really just led to some nice discussion about um, how to tweak the coding scheme uh, so that it fit the data better. Um, and we made those adjustments in the moment during the training. Um, you know, people would say, you know, these two codes seem really similar. I'm not sure how to use them differently. So we would talk about that and we would um, make adjustments in the moment with that feedback. We ended the day uh, by assigning homework to everybody. And it, um, so we asked each, we assigned each coder, each of the four coders to one of the four states in the study. Um, so we told each coder to pull one of the school transcripts uh, from their state and code it in NVivo. And then we told them to tell their senior reviewer when they were done and the senior reviewer um, would then go into NVivo and look at the work they'd done and just see where they agreed, where they disagreed, um, and just provide feedback to each other. And, and I'll talk about the different kinds of staff a little while later. Um, 
about the senior reviewers and the, and the role that they had. So they had two days to do that homework, and then we met a couple days, then we met to talk about that exercise. Um, and th these were the questions that we posed to the team, and each coder and each senior reviewer sort of shared their thoughts, and it was just a really, these check-in discussions after uh, they did their first test run on their own were just always so helpful. Um, it was a really important time for learning and staff were able to voice the issues that came up for them, um, any places where the coder and reviewer couldn't agree. And they, so we, you know, any instances where there was disagreement, we would talk about it as a team and everybody would sort of weigh in on what they thought made sense. Um, and uh, lastly, we would check in on the timeline for coding that batch of transcripts. And, you know, th at the management level, we had thought, okay, we figure it'll take uh, however many minutes per school transcript. So they should need however many days to finish it. So after they did this um, first coding test run, uh, they let us know how long it took them. And you know that the first time is always gonna take a little longer while you're just getting used to things, um, but it, it just sort of gave us a reality check of whether the timeline that we'd set was realistic or not. Um, and in some cases, we added an extra day or two uh, to give the coders a little um, more time to do the work that they needed. So after this uh, check-in meeting, the coders and the senior reviewers worked mostly independently. The, you know, they would finish coding um, all of the school transcripts and the senior reviewer would go over a sample of their work early on to make sure that the codes were being applied correctly and consistently. Um, but, and they would check in as, as needed, but otherwise they worked largely on their own. So that's the process that we repeated for each type of uh, interview transcript that we had, the schools, the school districts, and then the two types of state uh, interview respondents that we had. We would um, do a training and then do a practice run and uh, have a team discussion after they had a chance to practice and we would tweak the coding scheme as needed based on what did or did not work well. Um, and then they would go off and finish that batch of transcripts. So. Once they were done with the schools, they went to this, we moved on to the school districts. And so we would train on the codes that applied specifically to that respondent type. And then they would practice and then they would code. And then we did the same thing for the states. Um, one unexpected benefit of staggering the coding this way is that the coders became really familiar with uh, the data that was collected from each respondent type and also the flow of the guide. Um, so it, it, what we found in the check-in discussions is that they it really helped them identify trends and also outliers. Um, so they just, you know, they just became very familiar with the data rather than bouncing around from one type of transcript to another where you're capturing different kinds of information. Uh, the second lesson that uh, we learned is that you've, um, our coding process would not have gone as smoothly as it did without uh, some very detailed reference materials that we made. Uh, and I just, I can't overstate how important this is. You know, when you've got multiple staff who are responsible for coding, as you know, most of you said that you do work with at least one other person, uh, you know, no two people think exactly alike about how and when to apply code. So you really need to have reference documents that uh, build this shared understanding of um, how you're going to systematically go through the data. Um, and it also, it, it's not just for the coders, but it's for the senior reviewers um, checking the work as well. All oh, right, so you can certainly build on this list, but these were the three types of um, reference materials that we used most often. Um, 
and I will show you what our code book looks like. Um, but so the code book, I'll just note to start is that we really treated it as a living document. We revised it as a team um, with every meeting, you know, and it wasn't big changes. It was, you know, changing how we defined something, um, how we defined a particular code, or it was um, sometimes we would um, find ways to better distinguish between two codes that felt very similar to the coders, you know, just tweaks like that. Um, so let me oh, pull it up. All right. So as I mentioned, we had some structural codes and we had analytic codes that we used. The structural ones mapped exactly onto uh, specific questions that we had in the interview guide. So these were sort of the high level topics um, that we covered. And it, the only thing that I want to mention here is that um, we didn't really need a definition for the structural codes because the they just they mapped exactly to questions in the interview guide um, which i'll show you in a second but um, what was nice about this is that uh, when you're reviewing one type of respondent we told the coders just to filter by respondent type so that they would only see the codes in the code book that applied to that particular respondent type so you know you're not getting confused about which apply to the one you're looking at. You can just filter it and that's all you'll see. Um, and the source in the guide, these are just the question number in the interview guide for the schools, SFA is school district, and then the state level ones. Um, the analytic codes, these were, um, this was really the more detailed codes that we applied to the data that we had. And so for these, there wasn't really a respondent and a source and guide for most of them because they could apply to any piece of text theoretically. Um, so, but what is nice is that for these, we really did try to define them because they don't apply to a specific question. They could come up anywhere. We wanted our team to know exactly when to apply them. Um, so we put definitions in here. And we also put notes about when to double code something or um, when not to use a particular code. Uh, like here's one where we said, don't use this code for the school level transcripts. So just stuff like that. Um, and you can see that for some of them, we do have uh, codes that apply to specific respondents. But anyways, the, the exact, um, the details of this are less important than just communicating that it's helpful to have um, all of these pieces to it, not just a list of codes, but definitions, notes on when and when not to use them, um, and which respondents to use them for, things like that, just to really um, make sure your team has all these details uh, at their disposal. Uh, so let me show you a little Bit about what I mean when I said the structural codes apply to specific pieces of the guide, because um, this was another reference material that we provided. So we, uh, for each of the uh, interview types, and I'll show you the schools, we gave them the blank interview guide with the structural codes applied to each question. Um, so this is just communicating to them that this particular code applies to question three, this code applies to question four, and so on and so forth. Some, some codes will apply to multiple questions in a row, but it really, you know, this is just a way that we wanted to show them um, how we might expect them to use codes uh, just based on the question alone. Uh, and what we did, um, after that was to, we also used um, comment bubbles. So I would use a comment bubble and, and uh, say that I think uh, in a transcript, we would probably apply analytic code X, Y, Z. So I, um, that's the last one. And obviously I can't show you um, 
the transcript for privacy reasons, but we would I took an actual transcript and it, I would use comment bubbles to identify to each piece of text in a transcript which codes would apply to that segment of text. And it, that was helpful too, because especially for the coders that had never done this before, they didn't understand the concept of double or triple coding. They didn't um, understand that you can use a code more than once. So, or that, you know, you might ask questions out of order when you're actually on site. So, you know, it just, it, using an actual transcript and using the comment bubble to say, for this piece of text, we would use code A. For this piece of text, we use code B, um, just to give them a real life example. Um, let me think if there's anything else to say about this. Um, oh, one additional document that we gave, and this wouldn't apply to every study, but we uh, gave them instructions on how to clean their transcripts um, and de-identify them. We had to de-identify it as one of the requirements of the contract and strip out all um, names, locations, that kind of identifying information. Um, but we also gave them written instructions on cleaning up typos, on cleaning up uh, any places where the transcription service we use had flagged something as inaudible or they couldn't hear it, so they couldn't uh, write out whatever that piece of text was. So we gave them some instructions on that as well. All right, so our management structure and approach uh, ended up being the uh, the final key to our success and it, um, the structure possessed really three main elements. We had very clear roles and responsibilities for each person so everybody knew exactly what they were responsible for. Um, we talked often <laughs> and we also uh, set, you know, sort of short-term milestones to hit um, rather than giving them you know, just our ultimate deadline and just saying finish in a month. And this last lesson, you know, about establishing a strong management structure, this is the kind of thing that to me always seems like a fluff point, but, you know, we've all been part of teams that either aren't well organized or aren't well coordinated. Um, and there's just, it leads to just so much confusion. Um, and it uh, also just, maybe nobody to review the quality of the work. So, um, you know, there's a lot of different management structures that can result in inefficient coding. So uh, we created uh, several distinct roles on our team and we had a very clear division of responsibility. Um, there were the coders and it, uh, these were, you know, these were the ones that were actually doing the brunt of the work. They were coding the data. Um, they, uh, not all of them had coding experience, like I mentioned, um, but their work was always reviewed by a senior reviewer. And the, the senior reviewer was um, part of the management team for this study, so they really knew the research questions, the study objectives, everything. They uh, we're also all subject matter experts in the school meal programs. Um, and it, one of our senior reviewers didn't have experience with coding either, but two did. So, you know, even in that uh, role, there can be a little variation in the level of experience. Um, and then it, uh, the lead analyst, which um, was the role I filled, the lead analyst you know, on any project, at least in my mind, they should be somebody who's an experienced coder, an analyst, um, but also just the database manager. You know, uh, that's a problem I see a lot of teams run into is that you can know how to code, but how to build a coding scheme, how to build a database that will help you accomplish your objectives. It takes a lot of thought, um, and it, so you really need somebody that can do that. And then uh, above me, we brought in um, a qualitative methodologist who had not been part of the study. And so they provided sort of a gut check on 
the strategy that we came up with um, and the process that we used, and they helped a lot with the training as well. Um, but the big point here is that we built in layers of support for everyone. Everybody had somebody that they could go to with questions. So the coders first point of contact was there's the senior reviewer that they were paired with. The senior reviewers would come to me and then I would bounce ideas off of the methodologist. So each of us had somebody to go to um, just to talk things out if we got stuck. And so the, uh, as I explained a minute ago, we uh, had a few different kinds of meetings. So there would be a training meeting um, prior to the start of coding each type of transcript. And then you would check, you, we would have check-in meetings, uh, usually just a couple days after that. But regardless, it would be early in the coding process for each type of transcript. And those were just really valuable moments to check in with our team, offer support and uh, talk through the timeline and make any revisions that we needed to um, but it just it made it feel very collaborative and everybody i think felt really um, supported um, and finally we had our general you know we've got five to six weeks to code everything kind of timeline in our head but we broke it out into pieces and so I will show you what that looks like. This is, <laughs> this is actually our staffing. So these are the coders and senior reviewers that we paired up. There's me. Um, so our timeline worked out like this. We did our full day team training that um, I talked a lot about at the beginning. And then a couple days after that, uh, their, the coders homework was due. And so it was due by the time we did our school coding check-in. And then you would finish your school, you know, once the check-in was done, we felt like questions were done, they went off on their own. And we, uh, based on the timeline check that we did in the check-in, um, we figured it would take about 10 days and they would finish the schools. Then we would move on to the SFAs. Um, and then they would have homework, we would check in, and then they would go off on their own and finish that, and then we would do the state. So it sort of broke it out into chunks. Um, but what was nice about this is that it, 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 give, it gave our team some quick wins. You know, instead of saying to them, you've got you know, five weeks to code up 154 documents, good luck. It's, you know, that's rather daunting. So instead it was easier to say, you know, in the next 10 days, we want you to finish just the school transcripts. And same thing for the SFAs, you know, in the next however many 11 days this is, we want you to finish coding the SFA transcripts. So it, it broke it out so that it felt a lot more manageable. Um, and it, it, it just gives you uh, the ability to celebrate each accomplishment before moving on to the next one. And it just keeps the momentum going. So this is what our your timeline looks like. So those were the three main things that uh, we took away from um, this study and the work that we did. And I added this last one um, about giving a lot of opportunities for communication and collaboration just because it is so important. Um, but, you know, when we feel pressed for time, the last thing we may feel like doing is setting aside time to meet as a team. Um, and I am very deadline driven, so I do understand that. Um, but, you know, it, it's really helpful and not just in the coding phase, but in the interview phase, um, you know, really just all throughout. There's there's a project I'm helping lead now and we have a, a big team of about 10 interviewers. And I want to know what they're hearing in the interview phase so that the coding scheme I develop and the database I design will allow me to capture the themes that they're hearing um, as well as the outlier cases. But it, it really influences the design and keeping that communication going through coding means that you can keep refining and tweaking it so that it fits both what your research questions are, but also the realities of the data that you have. Um, so, you know, some of these things we did from the start, 
and other lessons we learned over time. Um, we didn't know that that management structure would work as well as it did. We didn't know that breaking up the coding the way we did would work as well as it did. Um, but I hope it gives you some insight into one of the ways that you could structure your own teams um, to produce strong output. So here's my email uh, with any questions, but I'm also happy to answer any questions now that you might have. Great. Uh, thank you, Lindsay. That was, that was really very informative. I'm just going to make myself presenter and go over a few things and then I'll uh, happy to take, we do have some questions, so I'll read them to you in a second. Um, I have one question though, with your recent study, are you following the same type of protocol for organizing? Yes, yeah, we are. Um, and we've actually implemented more check-in meetings during the interview process because it's going to be a very, we're, we're working with a subcontractor, so our team is large, it's a cross organization, so uh, checking in all throughout is just proving, like I said, it's just, it's so helpful. <laughs> so Thank yeah. You. Uh, so I'm just going to go over a few kind of community announcements um, and then I will um, ask Lindsay the questions that you put in. Uh, so one thing I just wanted uh, to let people know what's going on with the community. Uh, so we do have more of our webinar series. So check that out. Uh, the View a podcast. Actually, uh, one of the podcasts is uh, I'm interviewing Lindsay and our virtual conference, our call for abstracts is now open. Um, if, and if you want to join the community, that'd be great. And the survey at the end, we have a question, would you like to join? And I just send you information on how to join. Uh, these are the upcoming webinars, uh, the links in the handouts. So this is all in the handouts. These links take you right to where you have to register. So please uh, feel free to register for these. Uh, and the virtual conference, so call for abstracts is open. This will take you to the website with more information and how to um, to submit an abstract and those are due June 30th. So we're excited about having our second virtual conference. And we are looking, so we have a early career researcher grant that will be announced relatively soon. Uh, it is $25,000 over two year period. Right now we're looking for reviewers. So if you would like to help our research director, Silvana Di Gregorio, <clears throat> with the review process, uh, please great, go right here and um, submit your request. So for with that, I will go to the questions and just go and find the first one. And while I do this, uh, people had asked about the article and I actually have a copy of the article. So hopefully people can see that. Um, um, oh, sorry, I just want to make sure. So, yeah, so if people can see the article there, so you can find that. Uh, a Sage is the publisher. All right, sorry, I'll just go to the questions. Um, so, the first question um, is from Adam To what extent does your coding scheme change when you get the results and see new responses that might not fit into your plan? That's a good question. Uh, the answer is all the time. <laughs> it changes all the time. Um, but that's part of why it's a living document. Um, you know, and that's, it, you know, I mentioned that in that first check in meeting, that's really um, where we make most of the changes to a coding scheme for a particular type of transcript that we have. Um, because you know each of the coders had reviewed one of their transcripts from each of their states so we had four different transcripts and so they were able to tell me in those check-in meetings um, based on the four that they looked at what did or didn't fit um, and so they would only be they would only each be one transcript in for coding at that point so any changes that we needed to make at that point it wasn't time consuming for them to go back to just that one that they've done and recode things using the revised coding scheme. Um, but it just meant that it would fit, it usually would fit much better for the rest of the transcripts that they had to look at. And then as sort of unique one-off cases came up here and there, um, 
you know, they would usually just email me or call me and let me know that they didn't know how to code a particular thing. And we would just talk about it. And if there was a change that um, they needed to make, or if there was a change that we needed to make to the coding scheme, um, I would let the whole team know that I was going to make that change and how they should use it. Um, but that didn't happen too often because that first check-in meeting really gave us a feel for the edits we needed to make. Great, thank you. Um, Olivia is asking, when you edited or amended the code book, did you go back and recode previously coded data to a line? Yes, exactly. And it, uh, I think that fits the earlier question too, mm -hmm. that would um, we would revise, we would have each coder recode um, that one transcript that they just did based on the edits that we made. So they didn't get too far down the road. It's just one in for each of them. Um, great. And then um, Ismail has a question. Uh, thanks, well, thanks for the amazing presentation. How did you define the initial code list, structural and analytical? Oh, that, <laughs> it's, that's a hard one. Um, so the structural, uh, I don't know which is easier and which is harder. They both have their challenges. Um, but really, I, what I start with is just by looking back at the research questions that the client has, which was USDA. Um, and then I, uh, I looked at every type of interview guide we had, and I just, um, that was sort of, those two things were sort of my starting point, the research questions and the interview guides themselves. And I would create my list of questions um, based on the questions we asked, but also the data that I expected to emerge. Because I had done all of the interviews in one of the four states. So I had a feel myself for the kind of data we were gonna see. Um, and because our data collection team had been talking all throughout data collection, I also knew what was happening in other states. So it, it's sort of, uh, it, it's very, very iterative, um, but that's sort of where I started. Um, and uh, David has a question, did you calculate any kind of intercoder agreement? <laughs> I knew this would come up. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, so. Um, I managed, I had a, a, well, I was about to tell you something that I think would be way too detailed, but yeah, I, um, I pooled all of the coders work and merged it into one database. And then, um, and this was during the, um, after the initial training, um, but I would look at their coding and then I would look at, uh, you can run kappas to try to understand intercoder uh, reliability and consistency. Um, and so we did look at that, but that wasn't, you know, there's a lot that's been written about why, when kappas are good to use and what uh, some of the drawbacks are. And so that was one of the things that we did was using that tool in Invivo to calculate kappa scores, but it wasn't the only thing we looked at. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, and Tanya has a question. Um, I teach undergrad qualitative research and I'm trying uh, to get my university to purchase in vivo for my class so I can teach um, qualitative data analysis software. Do you think this kind of approach could be adopted to suit the classroom, maybe with a mock study? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I th yeah, I think it could. Uh, I know it's... It is uh, an expensive software to buy, um, but I think the more practice you can give your students, the, the better. And, you know, there's, I, yeah, the, the answer is yes. I think it could be helpful. Um, yeah, and I just want to say, though the software is expensive, we do have very good pricing for students um, and also f uh, institutional pricing that um, also, you know, is a little different than the individual. So just so you know that. Um, uh, so it is workable. I, I used it in my qualitative research class and I was a student and was able to, to buy it. Um, mm -hmm. Did you explore any AI tools to make coding move quicker or require fewer coders? Adam's asking. 
Uh, I did not. I am not as familiar um, with the technology there. Um, and I'm just not just not to plug in vivo, but just to let you know, we do have auto um, auto coding with theme sent and sentiment that you can use. Though I you wouldn't rely on that for all your coding, but it is a good way to jumpstart and look at your coding too. So if you're interested in trialing that, um, you can do that with in vivo. Um, here, Irene has a question. I wonder how many people were involved in developing the first version of the code book that was used as a starting point and what the procedure followed for that purpose. Um, so the code book, I'm reaching back in my, in my memory. Um, the qualitative methodologist that we brought in, she and I, developed it from the ground up. Um, and so really we started with just the list of codes and then uh, we started building the code book and writing in the details that I showed you. So which transcript it applied to, which questions, adding in definitions and notes and things. And part of that also was she and I, before we did the training with the team, we did our own pilot test runs. We did a, I think at least two, but we would pull, um, we pulled different kinds of transcripts, you know, school district, state, school level, and we tested it out on our own. Um, and, and then we would refine it. And so we made a lot of changes before we shared it with the team um, just to test it out. Um, let's see, I'm just going, looking through the questions. Just give me a second. I had some great, great questions. Um, um, I think most of them have been answered. I'm just trying to, I just want to make sure I'll go through. Um, if, there, if anybody has any other questions, let us know. Um, um, oh, uh, so here's a question, sorry. Um, all that you explain can be done without in vivo too. So do you use in vivo yeah. to share the team's in vivo project file with some transcripts coded by each team member and how? Yes, uh, so we, you can do this without in vivo, but for the quantity of data that we have, it's, the software just really, was the organizational tool that we needed. So what I would do is I made um, a master database um, from which all changes would flow. And then I created a copy of it for each of the four coders. So they each had their own database to work in. Um, and I would upload to their database just the transcripts from the state that they were assigned to. So they would do all the coding in there, um, but the coding scheme, the structure of the database, the sets that we had in there, the classification sheets that we made, everything was an exact replica of the master database. So when they were finished uh, with coding whichever transcripts they were working on, I merged them, I merged all of their individual databases and created a new master. Um, and that was sort of, and you know, sometimes mistakes happen and sometimes, you know, somebody deletes the, you know, one of the letters in one of the codes you have. So it creates like a duplicate, you know, so there's little things like that that do come up and, you know, nobody's perfect. So, um, but I was ultimately the keeper of the database. So all changes were ones that I was able to keep control of. Great. Well, um, those are all the questions, but we had some great questions. So I think this topic um, was very helpful to people, it seemed from, from the responses. Uh, so thank you, Lindsay, for uh, participating and presenting today. And I just wanna thank everyone for joining us. Uh, and don't forget, uh, register, register for more of those because it's all about researchers talking about what they're doing with their qualitative and mixed methods research. So, uh, so I just wanna thank you for joining me. Thank you. Have a great rest of your day, everyone. Bye.